Clement for sponsoring this talk. Um, it's really great to be, I wish we were there in person, but to be in Southern California. I was born in LA, um, went to Hamilton High, right at the corner of Robertson and Venice Boulevard, and spend as much time as I can in California. I'm going to get started right away so we can use all of our time. And I'm going to screen share. And I may need a little help making sure our systems are happy with each other. Okay, can somebody nod? Are we good? Thank you. Thank you. This is um, this talk comes from my book that just came out, California, A Slave State. And today I want to focus on the history of slavery in a state that's not generally considered, in fact, has not been considered a slave state. I also want to talk about the slave revolts and slave resistance in California. It's been interesting to me that the reviews of the book have only talked about the hidden history of slavery in California, but they've ignored the fact that every time slavery came down in California over its 250 years of slavery, every single time in every single location, there were slave revolts, slave re resistance, communities came together. The first lawsuit that I'm aware of ever for reparations was filed in California. I've been testifying before the California Reparations Commission, and we can talk about that toward the end or if you have questions about it. But this is not a only a brutal, horrific, vexed, phenomena in the history of the West and in the history of the United States, but it was a history that was also resisted. And this isn't just to make my rebel soul happy, it's a fact of our history of the West. This is the map, it's a famous map, it's called the Reynolds map, it came out in about 1855, and it's the map that took us into the Civil War. It's everything is wrong with this map. And let me just speak to that. The pink areas are the free states. If we did this properly and we know that maps are political, um, that would be a lot, much larger chunk of the geography. The gray areas are the slave states. You can see that by this point, it already included. Texas as a slave state. Very quickly, Texas had over 200,000 enslaved African-Americans picking cotton. And in fact, as people came west, rather than transport enslaved people with them, just to save the money, they just bought them in Texas. And then they have California also in pink as a free state. And my point of my book, my the title of the book, California Slave State, and my argument is that California was not a free state. And in fact, it's not a free state now that it has got one of the fifth largest areas of human trafficking in the globe. And among the top areas of human trafficking in the United States. Let's look at the green area. The green area are what was going into the Civil War, the territories. And one of the deals about the Civil War had to do with these territories. Were they going to enter the United States as slave states or free states? And we'll talk about that more. But if we look at the Southern portion of these free states, and I haven't figured out how to put a 
pointer on this, but in 1848, the United States wins the war against Mexico. It was a brutal, swift war. And the spoils of war is that the United States takes between the top third and the top half of Mexico. And that includes what was, what is Arizona, New Mexico, parts of Utah, Nebraska, California. And we claim that and we intended to claim that. And those are the areas that have to be now decided, are they gonna come into the United States slave or free? What we need to take into this discussion is that the South always, always intended for slavery to extend to the Pacific coast. There have been dozens of explorers, Lewis and Clark, the whole bit, and we vaguely knew what was out west and the South wanted to turn it into slave states, slave area. Part of it is it was to control the economy, but the other part is that cotton and tobacco were crap for the soil and they had drained the soil. Um, we were importing fertilizer from Cuba and, and mainly from Peru. So this is a global story of how we kept slavery going in the United States, but it wasn't working. And the plan was take, to take slavery west. So as we look at this map, let's keep those intentions, those intentions to expand a slave economy to the west. Okay, I can't get the, slate, the slides to move. Hang on, because this whole thing is visual. I'm gonna to have to start over um, because I can't get these slides to move. There we go. All right, you're gonna get a preview on the left side of the, the slides because otherwise this isn't gonna work. Why did I write this book? A few things, as I was finishing my last book, Driven Out, The Forgotten War Against, uh, Against Chinese Americans, a few things came to me that haunted me and that I couldn't ignore. And one came soon after I finished the book, and it was a story in the Eureka Times Standard that a 15-year-old girl had been kidnapped in Lake County. Lake County is maybe the second or third county south of Oregon. It's an inland county, it's poor, and it's one of the centers, although it's not part of the pot emerald triangle, it's one of the centers for growing cannabis, for marijuana grows in California. And I can start by saying that I believe in the legalization of pot, both recreational and medicinal. That's not what this is about. What I didn't know is that marijuana in California is supported by human trafficking. And I read the story of a 15-year-old girl. She was homeless. She was wandering in Hollywood. She gets picked up by two guys and they drive her the length of the state and to their cannabis grow in Lake County. And they lock her in a metal crate. They lock her in this metal crate. And they drill two holes, as you can see. One is to hose her down, and the other is to poke her with a cattle prod. I was horrified. 
And they let her out in the late summer, early fall to trim the buds. And they let her out to force her to sexually service them and to also to sexually service the field workers in the marijuana grow. One day they drive her down to Sacramento. They're going shopping and they lock her in a motel room. This courageous and traumatized 15 year old girl locked in a motel room while these guys go shopping, sees a telephone, dials 911 and frees herself. And I was so taken as the mom of two daughters with the courage of this girl, the trauma and the courage to free herself that I felt, and it was very close to where I have a cabin and have since I started teaching. My first job was at Humboldt State. Um, and I'm in love with Northern California and I could not believe how ignorant I was that I didn't know that this was happening in my backyard. And that's how this story came to me and I felt that it had to be told. In 1848, the United States signs, as probably many of you know, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, in which we take the top third of Mexico. But it's also the year that gold is discovered nearby the ranch of John Sutter. John Sutter is making his fortune very quickly, not only in gold, but he is going to make his fortune in renting out and selling Native Americans to other ranchers um, as slaves to work on the land that's been opened up by this new transfer of territory. Very quickly, people are coming, hundreds of thousands of people are coming from all over the world to dig for gold. What I didn't know and this is going through the California school systems and Berkeley and getting to study with incredible, incredible teachers. I didn't know that the South brought over 2000 enslaved plantation workers west to dig for gold on their behalf. 2000 enslaved African-Americans, mostly men, but some women were marched they didn't even travel in the wagons across the plains to dig for gold on behalf of their slave owners. Their families were left behind in the South, held hostage um, so that people who had gone between two and 3,000 miles, whether from Missouri or Mississippi or Georgia, across the plains um, to dig for gold in California. Very quickly, the United States wants California in the Union. We are shipping $1.5 billion in then money of gold east to the banks, to the insurance companies, um, to pay for the costs of the war against Mexico. There was no doubt that Californ California was going to be admitted to the Union. But if you recall from your SAT exams, there was a trifecta, the Missouri Compromise, which meant that for every state that was admitted, a slave state and a free state would be admitted at the same time. But there was no state to admit with California and the country wasn't gonna wait for this. They wanted California, they wanted the land for settlement, and they wanted the money from gold. This is an enslaved African-American. There are several pictures of him. And in some, there's a man sitting armed in a wagon watching him mine for gold. The, uh, this is called a long tom and it sifted the mud for flecks of gold. He often, the enslaved Blacks in California didn't know that they were in a free state, and they didn't know 
that how easy it was to flee in California with the rivers, with the forests, with the redwood trees, with the eight, 800 miles of coastline, it wouldn't have been hard to flee. After a while, enslaved Blacks do learn this. And under the Missouri Compromise, this trifecta, there were three parts. Number one, California would enter the Union as a free state. Number two, Utah and Nebraska were free to choose. In other words, so much for the compromise. And three, and this was also the most dangerous part of this trifecta, in 1850, the United States passes the Fugitive Slave Act. And it meant that any Black person in the North could be targeted as a runaway, seized and sold in the South. What enslaved Blacks didn't anticipate and free Blacks who came out for gold didn't know that they were gonna find each other in California. And our first civil rights movement in California was organized by free Blacks to um, protect themselves from the Fugitive Slave Act to claim their rights as free Blacks and protect themselves and also to find freedom and create freedom by seizing enslaved Blacks and helping them flee north to Canada, south to Mexico. And more important was to set up a system so that their freedom would be honored in the courts. California holds a constitution and in it, California writes, because they're told to write it, slavery will never be tolerated in California. But this was an out. It was bogus because tolerate is not a legal standard. So to say slavery will never be tolerated um, was meaningless, although it satisfied the US Congress. The other thing that was in the California Constitution was that neither Native Americans or African Americans, and then they follow this up with law, um, could testify in court. Immediately, California holds three colored conventions. This was something I also didn't know about. Across the United States, starting in the 1830s, were hundreds and hundreds of colored conventions where Black people gathered to demand their rights. And of course, the first right was freedom. I didn't understand, as I read through the minutes of the Colored Conventions of California, why the word freedom didn't come up. All of them were about the right to testify. What I had to understand is that if you were enslaved, and you were not allowed to testify in court, you couldn't present your freedom papers and you could be seized. Women are not supposed to cry at work. And I have to tell you that when I saw the 8,000, 8,000 petitions demanding the right to testify, and they're in the California State Archives, um, I just wept in the archives how did people with no railroad um, trains, no roads, no communication systems, how did the Black community in California create 8,000 petitions demanding their right to testify? And it took the entire decade of the 50s for them to win their right. Some people contest the idea that California was a slave state. This was an ad that we would think we would find in something like a paper out, a newspaper out of New Orleans or Georgia. This is from the San Francisco Herald Examiner, and it's an ad selling an enslaved black person. Um, I value him at $300, but if say, or all of his abolition brethren wish to, wish to show they have honor, then they will pay for him. So this is an ad 
in a California newspaper within a couple of years of statehood advertising for the sale of a black person. The first enslaved people in California were um, enslaved by the Spanish in 1769, just as we are revving up for the War of Independence. Um, Spain invades California to start the chain of missions. Right now, we think of missions as tourist attractions. Um, I can't tell you, I went in, when I taught at UCSD, I went to weddings and baptisms and quinceaneras at the San Diego mission. I didn't understand that they were sites of captivity for the Native Americans across the coastal chain of California. Ultimately, there were 21 missions started by the Spanish, the invasion of Father Junipero Serra, who enters California with about 100 Spanish soldiers and eight fanatical priests determined, one, to convert Californian Native Americans um, and their caring and order from the Pope. But the other is to build plantations because what they wanted was agriculture. And again, we have to think globally. They wanted agriculture to feed the enslaved Native Americans who were working in the silver mines in Mexico and Peru. So there were two goals of control through conversion, seizing people from their villages and growing food to support a system of slavery in Latin and South America. This is what, well, you don't get the camera really till 1845. So the missions would have looked pretty run down, but this is what the mission looked like. What I also didn't know is that there were slave revolts at the first mission. This is the slave revolt and engraving from the slave revolt at the mission of San Diego de Acala and the Kumeyaay people organized in 1775, the first slave revolt in California, where it takes six months. The Kumeyaay went from Northern Mexico through San Diego, almost up to Orange County. And they organize in small clans to build new arrows, to make new strings out of animal tendons for their bows and arrows. And in 1775, they come down from the mesas and invade Mission San Diego, burn it to the ground, kill the head priest, the main slaveholder, and free all of the Kumeyaay people never to return. So now this is the tourist image, the Taco Bell image of the missions. Probably some of you did that fourth grade mission project where you built missions out of who knows, matchsticks or straw. Um, sugar cubes were good for building um, the San Diego, for building the missions. I live in DC. My kids, actually it was my husband, built the Supreme Court out of sugar cubes. But in California, it was the missions. And this is the tourist image of, a gen of the generic mission that these postcards are still sold and promoted as one of the main tourist attractions. And of course we know the architecture, mission architecture, mission furniture, which is very heavy, very expensive, um, that came from the illusion of what the missions were, the 21 missions. The first slaves imported, transported into California were Alaska natives. The Russians invade Alaska. They're looking for that same route to China. This is the Bering Sea that you see in front of you. It's a chain of islands, the Aleutian Islands. And Bering capsizes his ship looking for this route to China. And as he lay dying, 
his sailors discover sea otters. And after the Russians wipe out the otters in Alaska, otters have a million pieces of fur per square inch. They're silkier than mink or sable. And they capture the Alaska natives who knew how to slaughter the otter. They did it minimally for the warmth of their fur in these kayaks. You can see the, the caps and in the back is the Russian sailing ship, almost visually guarding, marking the control of Russia. When they have decimated the tribes and wiped out the sea otters, they head down the coast, they turn right, and they land probably a few miles from our cabin in Northern California in Trinidad Bay. They work their way south and they build a fort, Fort Ross in Sonoma County, which Putin believes he still owns. This is in Forbes magazine, not the radical press, the black press. Putin believes he owns the square of California at Fort Ross. The very first law that California passes is the 1850 Act for the, protect, the Government and Protection of the Indian. This is probably one of the most vexed and troubling images in the book. It is of a very young Native American girl. She's enslaved. She's been taken as a wet nurse to provide her breast milk for this baby. Um, we're an interracial family and my daughter says, this is the whitest baby she's ever seen. But if you look at this almost parody, this cruel parody of a Madonna and child, this is not a look of love, of tenderness or protection on the face of this Native American girl. She's wearing, it's a, you can barely see at the bottom, it's a studio photo. Um, who would take an enslaved girl and this baby who she is forced to nurse into a studio to compose this photo? What kind of titillation, voyeurism, or power is embedded in this photo? And those of you in American studies, I've spent time with my students, hours looking in and trying to understand this photo, but the 1850 Act for the Protection and Government of the Indians legalizes the forced kidnap, sale, and forced indenture of California Native Americans. And this girl was a refugee, a runaway um, from the torching of the Native American villages. They were torched to open land for settlers settler colonialism, where the land would really be conquered through settlement. And mainly women and children were on the run and they were snagged, legally snagged, indentured, and sold to serve as ranch hands, servants, domestic servants, and nannies. With the gold rush came Chinese, the first Chinese migrants to the United States. It's a very gendered story. The Chinese men who came to the United States for the gold rush came like everybody from around the world came for money, for wealth, to get away from poverty at home, for adventure. They came usually with an uncle, a relative, two or three members of a village were often given tickets to come to California. But the story of the girls is different. The Chinese, there were very few women in California and the Native Americans were on the run. And Chinese girls throughout the 1850s through the 1880s 
long past the Civil War, are kidnapped from the port cities of Guangdong, Canton, and transported, sometimes in padded boxes. The girls were strip searched and sold on the docks of San Francisco, or they were sold in slave dens in Chinatown. They were forced, this is a brothel, a caged whorehouse, where a girl was forced to service 20 men a day, and the money was collected by her owner or her pimp. I cannot imagine being raped 20 times a day and my body sold for the profits of others. There was a curtain, the pimp or madam would close the curtain, the girl would, having solicited customers through these caged windows, would service the man, he would leave, she would turn over her money to the madam or pimp and the curtain would be opened and she would be forced to do this again. Many of these girls were able to flee. Sometimes a sympathetic customer would help them to flee. Sometimes they hid money and they paid off somebody from the San Francisco Police Department. Sometimes just if the door was opened, they charged out and fled. And they're the ones who along with the Chinese men who came for the railroad or the mines started the Chinatowns all across Northern California. Another source of slavery in California where it was at the Indian boarding schools. The model starts where this picture was taken at the Indian boarding school in Carlisle, California, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It's around the turn into the 20th century. The United States passes a law requiring Indian education, but there were no public schools on the reservations. And Indian children were taken and there were 12 Indian boarding schools in California. They were taken and they were forced into what was called the outing programs. I didn't understand. I mean, outing meant something different to me until I did this book. The day a child was seized and taken to a boarding school, he or she was stripped of their native clothing. They weren't allowed to speak their language. This is a one day picture, a before and after picture where the boys are taken from their native clothing out of their native clothing and dressed in these scratchy wool uniforms. The boys at the boarding schools in California and really across from Kansas, Pennsylvania were sent into what was called outing programs, which meant sent out to work. This was the education they were given. The girls, this is a classroom. It doesn't look like the classroom I was in or the classrooms my kids were in. These are girls being taught to iron and they're gonna be sold into domestic service. This is at the Sherman Boarding School in Riverside in Southern California. This is a classroom. The girls are being taught to iron and they're gonna be sent out as servants into the new households, the ranches, and the new hotels that are springing up. Southern California becomes a tourist center. The boys were generally sent to work in the new citrus groves. These are children forced to grow their own food and they're scruffing for potato field, for potatoes. This picture is also from Sherman School in Riverside. And you can see the guy standing over them either with a stick or a gun. This is one of the classes at Sherman School in California. These are children who are being trained to be sent out to either work in the fields or to work as domestic servants and particularly for the girls. And I think we cannot ever forget how sexually vulnerable girls are in slavery. At the missions, the, there was a room called the Monieras, 
in the Monieras with the female dormitories, and every night in the Monieras, either the priests or the Spanish soldiers came in to choose the girl or the woman they wanted for that night. And then they were forced to, the girls who were not chosen were forced to sing to drown out the sounds of sex. And then the girls would be brought back into the Monieras. These rooms are not shown to tourists and to serve the priests. These are um, one of the classes at Sherman Indian School. Another source of slavery in California is the beginning of what we've all become more familiar with of the term, the carceral state, of how convicts and prisoners are turned into unpaid forced laborers. There were 400 ships in San Francisco Bay. Captains and sailors abandoned their ships for the gold rush to rush into the Sierras to hunt for gold. And under contract from the state legislature, the prisoners for petty crimes, shoplifting, theft, were seized and put on these prison brigs this is the one that sailed up the Sacramento River, the LaGrange, and they built prisons on top of the ships. And then they sailed the ships around San Francisco Bay to build the streets of San Francisco and Sacramento, to build the sewage systems, and to rent them out to work on the new mansions. The contractor who got an, a $100,000 contract to set up the penitentiary system owned the prisoners. It's in his contract that they had the ownership of the prisoners. And finally, the legislature says to the contractor, build the damn penitentiary, and they build San Quentin prison. And in the basement of San Quentin prison, they build factories. And the contractor owns these prisoners, and he rents them out to private corporations I talk about what they did more in the book, but one of them was a mill and 1200 prisoners had to stand at 1000 looms and weave burlap bags for the new agriculture to hold wheat. You weren't allowed to move, you weren't allowed to talk or you were tortured. There is no way I could stand, no way I could stand for 12 hours and not move and not speak or face torture. This is the torture that was faced in San Quentin prison if you, dis if you disobeyed as a slave laborer building furniture or weaving burlap bags. This is, a, it was copied from Auburn prison in New York and this is a form of early waterboarding. Moving on, so we have time for questions and answers. Um, I spoke about California now being one of the top sites of human trafficking in the country, and indeed sites of human trafficking in the globe. Sorry. Um, this is one of the ways that we are working with the police and health care workers to identify people who've been human trafficked. And one of the ways is by the tattoos. Um, so that if a cop is arresting a girl, if he can identify a tattoo, that he can know that in fact she's unfree and move toward rescuing her. This is a barcode. It is a common tattoo of a girl who is being trafficked. Another one that healthcare workers, police officers, teachers, um, especially high school teachers are being, and nurses are being taught to identify is a crown. A tattoo of a crown identifies a girl who is under the rule of someone else. And the different crowns signify the different owners. 
This is an Egyptian girl. She was sold in Egypt and transported to Southern California to work as a nanny. She was kept in a shed built above a garage. And this is actually taken after she was freed. Um, she's written an amazing young adult um, autobiography that is phenomenal to teach because she tells her own story. And her name was Shemima Hall. And when she was 12 years old, a neighbor noticed that why was this little girl taking care of other little girls, other children in a park? And she calls social services and they come and they rescue the girl. They arrest the parents, the not the parents, her owners, her Egyptian owners who had moved to um, Southern California and kept her, um, she was allowed to eat scraps from the floor after she was done doing the dishes. She sleeps in this shed over the garage. And the minute she's rescued, she's put into foster care, three sequential families. She wins $60,000 in the lawsuit against the people who kidnapped her and her foster families sees the money, which she never sees, and she tells her story in this book called Hidden Girl. This is an affidavit that was written by an enslaved Chinese girl. Her name was Yoglin. She's one of my heroes. And after she freed and runs away, she flees to the town of Sonora, which was actually in the foothills of the Sierras. It was a gold rush town. Her name was Yoglin. And Yoglin climbs the stairs of the courthouse in Sonora. And she says, I want to write an affidavit. And she writes in her own language. She dictates it. My husband, Charlie, is in jail. This is an affidavit to claim to announce that I am a free woman and no man may ever own me again. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. Will, do you want to take over and field the questions? Yes, thank you so much. That was excellent. Really appreciate that um, summary of your of your work. Um, yeah, let's open it up. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to unmute and uh, and ask your question directly. Or if you want to raise your hand, I can call on people. If we have, I think there's a couple of comments in the chat, but I'm just worried about losing the screen right now. And I'm happy to reshow any of the images if if people want. But I'm open to any questions. Okay, Will, you're mic'd. Oops. Your your mic is off and I can't hear the question. So if you could repeat it kindly. You're muted. There you go. Sorry, we have a couple of a uh, couple of devices going on in this room, so there's some feedback. Um, I, I mean, I'm happy to start. I, I have a question. Um, I, I noticed throughout your book, and <clears throat> you pointed this out in your lecture, especially with the last slide. But throughout your book, you do this really wonderful job of incorporating um, the voices of the victims of slavery, and I, I'm wondering, like, how how difficult was it to find those voices? I mean, like the, the in the the uh, the beginning of your book, you 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 have an entire um, what is it, like a like a, a autobiography, like a letter or something. And I'm just wondering, like, how how did you come across these? And are, are there lots of these? I mean, or have you included like everything you could find? 
Um, what I'm going to do is um, my next project, and I've just started working on it, is to put out a collection of these voices because I really only was able to incorporate a portion of them. I mean, like much hidden history, it's not hard to find. It's hidden right below the surface. And one thing led to the next. I spent a lot of time at the Bancroft Library at Berkeley. With, and I went to many historical societies to look through their letters, their diaries, and papers at the Beinecke Library at Yale. And it shouldn't be at Yale because Yale is too far for people to travel to. It's very expensive to stay there. I had a little fellowship, um, but they've got a Western Americana collection. So UCLA has a good collection. All of the museums have these materials. Local historical societies have these materials. And once you put the word out, um, then people get in touch with you. I wrote a little article called Hanging Out, How to Do Research. And I think that that's a methodology article. Um, for example, there is a picture I didn't show today of an enslaved Native American nanny with a white family. They're all in Victorian dress. And I wanted a copy of the picture. And um, it was up near Willow Creek in Northern California. And I call up to the Historical Society and say, you know, how can I buy a copy of this picture? And it's the, in the midst of the big fires of a few years ago. And she said, well, my husband's on the fire line and we've got a kid, but when he comes down from the fire line, I'll cross it and go into the locked historical society and get you a copy of this image because we want this image to be seen. And lo, you know, within about 10 days, I get a perfect TIFF copy. It's in the book of that photograph where people want the story told. Um, and it's random, it's haphazard, but in fact, it's really by being candid about what you're looking for and realizing that local historians want the story out. Um, even Sherman, even Sherman Indian School, which is still operating, and it's almost like an HBCU. It's a very popular school for Native Americans to send their kids to, especially if their kids are athletic. It's a, a path to college. They've now got all of their archives are at National Archives. So you can spend a lot of time seeing letters from parents saying, give me back my kid, or letters from parents saying you've separated siblings, you won't let siblings talk to each other, or you're not letting my child speak in their native language. This history is documented and it's just up to us to go find it and tell it, but it's not hard to find. It was terrifyingly easy to find and for those of you who are faculty, one of my professors in American slavery was Kenneth Stamp at Berkeley, who wrote The Peculiar Institution. I had the privilege of studying with amazing people, but they didn't teach us this. Slavery, this slavery in the United States is still seen as a North-South story. And we're doing a better job now of looking at slavery in the North. I didn't know that New York tried to secede. And when I learned that, why did New York try and secede? It was because of the port. New York port was where the cotton from the South was shipped. And then it was dispersed across all the mills in upstate New York and New England. And if slavery was shut down, the port of New York would thought it would collapse. And so the pressures toward maintaining human bondage were all over the country. And the stories are all over the country.
Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, there's feedback here. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, do you want me to read those to you or mm -hmm. do you want to read them for yourself? That'd be easier because if I'm just scared, I'll lose something. I too have a lot of technology going on. Yes, please. Okay. okay. Uh, Ifioma, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing the name, says, uh, when I think of slavery, I think of the 13th Amendment that still constituted as a punishment through the loophole. Would you say that, would you say because of that loophole in the amendment has led to the legalization of slavery ac across the states, even in the liberal state of California? Oh, it's a really important question. The 13th Amendment says abolishes slavery except for punishment for a crime. Seven states now, only seven states have put into their constitution changes in the language of the 13th Amendment that says that you cannot use slavery as a punishment for a crime. Slavery is not punishment. You know, slavery is a form of human ownership that has no correlation to even a violent crime that's been committed. Um, so Amasa's question is absolutely um, key. I think that the 13th Amendment has been an out for states like California, and California has not abolished slavery under um, in its constitution as an amendment to the constitution um, with the idea that slavery is an important um, punishment for a crime. And in fact, we know that like down in Ojai, there are enormous prison factories. In one of the last chapters of my book, I talk about a t-shirt factory that's owned by a guy who used to own a t-shirt factory in Honduras. And the prisoners for no pay, for no pay, are, and with their food, their shelter, being guard, their cells, all supported by us, the taxpayers. Um, this guy who owns it, it's the prison is called Donovan Penitentiary near Ojai, California. And at Donovan, they're making t-shirts and they're working 12 or 14 hours a day. They're put in solitary if they talk. And the only reason we know this is that two African-American prisoners who are forced to work unpaid and tortured or put in solitary um, find a telephone and they call a TV station in LA. And the TV station in LA finds them a lawyer and works with them to get their story out. But this is happening all over California in one of the women's prisons in California um, that they are for Sony, you know, a brand many of us love and buy Sony products. Um, their job is to do ecological work and break down computers, but computers are toxic. You don't want to smash, even though we all have fits of rage at our computers, you don't want to smash up your computer because the lithium and the chemicals in the computer are toxic. And the women in these prisons from being forced to do this eco thing are getting all kinds of skin and lung cancer from taking apart computers they have to wear the same uniforms to their cell. The, the dust from the chemicals is in their bedding, on their clothing, and then it gets washed through the, um, the system, the water system of the prison. So our prison system in California is relying still on convict labor. And, and your student's question, if it's a student, it's really important. The, the outs, except as punishment for a crime, is critically important that that get changed. Thank you for that question. Okay, a question from the English 100 account. 
Why are the uh, Monherios not shown to the public? This is the first I've heard of the systematic raping of Native children. Why isn't this discussed more openly? What or who is responsible for the sanitizing of this part of the history of the missions? I think that there is a great deal of history of the missions that's not being taught. Um, and even as it took us years to understand that within the church, the sexual assaults that are happening within the church and just last week, articles are starting to come out about the sexual assaults within the convents, um, that these are stories of brutality. They're not stories that are going to invite conversion or affiliation or allegiance. Um, I think that they are stories that people have buried. And I don't even know that those rooms, and I finished the book during COVID. So some of the travel that I would want to do, I wasn't able to do. Um, but I don't even know if those rooms are marked, but some of the better histories of the mission systems are exposing these histories. That's where I first learned about it and then took it further from published, you know, from published historical accounts. And the why is the same reason that we didn't know that we were living in a slave state, that this is a story that's been assigned to the South and the profits of human bondage are phenomenal. And the hidden profits, like the ones that come through the penitentiaries or the profits that come through the factories are work that we all really need to be doing. Um, the, the why is sort of what pushed me to write this book and yet I don't have an answer. I mean, I people have asked me a lot, what was it like to spend the seven years it took to write this book, living with this kind of brutality? And during some of our toughest past years at the presidential level and at the Senate levels, um, I actually, instead of feeling only daunted by my work, I also felt inspired for Chinese girls to flee from being in a cage, for um, a whole tribe to free their people from the mission. I didn't know that in Central California, at Mission Santa Barbara, Mission Inez, and Mission La Parisima, there were organized slave revolts. This takes down the popular story of the missions. You know, the, the public story of this, the arches and the architecture, the involuntary kidnap and punishment. Um, if a woman at one of the missions miscarried, she was forced to stand out in front of the church on a Sunday with a red doll suggesting the blood of a miscarriage, to stand out in front of the church to confess her sin of miscarrying. Now, suddenly in the South, in the United States, we've suddenly become afraid. Women are becoming afraid of going to the hospital when they're miscarrying because they're going to be accused of having an abortion. And so I think it's really important that we think of the gendered nature of this history and also of the books. We wonder why I of a different generation didn't learn this history and that's before books were being banned in the schools. You know, if the books were there, I was at least able to sniff them out. And who knows what I read? I read everything I could get my hands on with a flashlight under the covers. That's a totally inadequate answer because I think I don't- My colleague in philosophy, Dr. Ted Stolls has a question. 
He says, yeah. uh, thank you for this deeply moving presentation, Professor. Could you discuss how extensive the abolitionist movement was in California? I recently visited the gravesite of Owen Brown, the son of John Brown in Altadena. And I know that there and in Pasadena, there was extensive activism, but where else? The activism, and it's a huge part of the book. We just, you know, we had 40 minutes or an hour. Um, the activism was all over the states. Um, when people came to the colored conventions, they came in, um, there were two in Sacramento, one in San Francisco before the Civil War, the 8,000 petitions. There are stories throughout of slave owners who came out to California, having marched the people across the, the country, marched them. And when they went belly up in the gold rush, they wanted to go back south. And there are amazing stories of free Black people who are snagging enslaved Blacks who are going to be shipped back south, snagging them from the middle of San Francisco Bay or from the rivers or the ports and freeing them. There were lawsuits, the freedom lawsuits, all over the state, the colored conventions, the um, attempts at legal changes, some of which worked. Um, so I think the movement was vast um, for abolition for the Chinese girls. Some of them fled to the missions, um, not the, the Spanish missions, but the Methodist and Presbyterian missions where they were held. Sometimes there was a lot of pressure on them to marry off because there were too many girls fleeing to these missions. Um, the slave revolts at the um, Franciscan, at the Catholic missions, up through these two guys who managed to make a quick phone call to a TV station. I think my book is also a history of abolition in California. And that's what kind of, in some of my bleakest moments um, during the Trump years were what gave me courage was to hang on, was to tell the story of resistance. question here but you know we're almost out of time and i, I don't want uh to lose anybody um but we're going to be buying copies of of this book so if anybody who's in the audience here if you're interested in a copy um you can either email me directly and i'll type that into the chat um, or you can just drop your email into the chat and i'll just put you on the list and we'll make sure uh to get you a copy of the book um but the the last question here uh is again from the english 100 account um, can you please explain how the modern slavery practice of tattooing works? Are women tattooed to show ownership or is the tattooing a form of punishment for trying to escape in order to prevent uh, future escape attempts? Oh, great question. I think it really works both ways. I think that if you're forcibly tattooed, that's of course a, a kind of physical punishment to your body. Um, and I know the popularity of tattoos now, um, but this is something involuntary. And mainly the tattoos were initiated to show ownership, um, to show ownership of, of, a, of a person's body. And the tattoos are most common in, if we break down human trafficking into labor trafficking, and sex trafficking. And there's no way that we think of sex trafficking not as a kind of labor. But if generally the field, the discussions are broken in those two, the tattoos are happening in the sex trade, in the forced sex trade. And both boys and girls are being seized from foster care. They're being seized from detention centers at the border. They're being seized from the streets. Um, runaways, kids who are addicted are very vulnerable to being seized. Um, 
There are books that you can buy on Amazon that tell you how to do it, um, which was very creepy. I became, and it's at the end of my book, I became very close to a woman who had been trafficked and managed to escape and walked me through the various processes. Right now, um, most of the human trafficking is not happening, sex trafficking on the street, but it's happening on the web. This same young woman was involved in shutting down a journal, a magazine, a web magazine called Backpage.com. And Backpage.com was the Amazon of human trafficking for whatever act, kind of person, inclination, it was easy to hunt and find on Backpage. And this woman worked with the attorneys to shut down Backpage.com. So both the abolition and the sex trade are happening, but on those ads, she was forced to post the tattoos that would identify what deeds different girls would be forced to do. So it's definitely both a mark of ownership and pain and humiliation, but also an advertisement. Important question. I just wanna thank you to um, the college for hosting me and your students and your faculty for really great questions. Thank you so much. I'm also not hard to find. If anybody wants to find me, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll try and get back to you as quickly as I can. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Felzer. We really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us. Um, this is a great lecture and, uh, and it was wonderful reading your book. It's really well-written and interesting and um, yeah, it's a side of California that that uh, I think you mentioned. It's not California dreaming, right? There's something else going on um, that I think we ought to um, pay close attention to, and it's still happening today. So, yeah, thank you so much again, and um, thanks to everybody for making it today. Really appreciate you showing up. Okay, bye bye then. Bye, everyone.